A warm welcome to TV Africa News and thank you for always joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najima Lima, but first are the headlines. Somali national found with explosive detonator arrested. Rwanda genocide suspect tried in France. Chipta Gay makes a shortlist for World Athlete of the Year. I will welcome once again now the news in detail. Police in Kampala have arrested a Somali national who was found with an explosive detonator in his vehicle as he tried to access a Speak Resort Hotel in Munyonyo. According to the police spokesperson Fred Nanga, the detonator was recovered by security guards at the entrance of the hotel in Munyonyo as they carried out security checks on the vehicle as it tried to access the premises. Inanga said that the device was discovered by the security as they did a thorough search of the vehicle, a Toyota Wish, which was being driven by Abdul Karim Mayowu, a 25-year-old Somali national and resident of Lunguja in Nwaga Division. The police spokesperson said that on interrogation, the Somali national said as a special hired driver, he had been hired by one Muhammad Hassan, 28, another Somali national, to go pick his mother and siblings from the hotel. Enanga said that police has now arrested the two and other close associates of the family, including a 40-year Asil Yassin and 20-year-old Max Bell Maso. The developments come on the backdrop of twin blasts that hit Kampala last week, killing seven people and others sustaining injuries. A total of 106 suspects have so far been arrested in the operations. Opposition Democratic Party has appointed Anthony Wadimba as its flag bearer in the race to fill the position of Kayunga District Chairperson. This is after the sudden death of the former Kayunga District Chairman, Mr. Fefeka Serubogo, on the 17th of June 2021. Nalugo reports. Addressing a news conference at their party headquarters in Kampala, DP President Jeno Nobat Mao said Mr. Anthony Wadimba is capable of representing DP and taking back the district in the hands of the people of Kayunga. I believe we have chosen the best possible candidate from within the ranks of DP. And I believe we have chosen the best possible candidate from among all the political parties that are going to fight. On June 17th, the body of the Kayunga district chairman, Fefe Kaserwogo, was found hanging on a tree behind his house. Police investigations indicated that Serwogo had committed suicide, but DP President Nobat Mao termed the untimely death of the district chairman as controversial, calling for thorough investigations. The people know what happened, but they don't have a platform to say it. And I'm sure the cause of Mr. Serwogo's death is going to be one of the campaign issues. Kayunga must be safe for those who fight to defend the people. One of the issues affecting Kayunga residents is land grabbing, which George Fred Kajimu, who is the vice president of DP in Buganda region, also the former mayor of Mukono municipality, saying that DP flag bearer has come to solve among other issues. I know the situation in Kayunga. People in Kayunga are living in an environment of insecurity. And the insecurity is mainly caused by land grabbing. It's caused by general poverty of the people. The Electoral Commission last month rolled out a program for the by-elections across the country. Nomination of candidates at respective district headquarters will take place on November 29th and November 30th, while elections in Kayunga will be held on December 16th. Nalugo Muingo, Africa Today. Uganda will, on the 26th November 2021, launch the beginning of the 16 days of activism campaign against gender-based violence themed Orange the World and Violence Against Women and Girls Now, majorly aimed at eliminating gender-based aggression. Kachanshu has more. 
addressing the press today at the Uganda Media Center. The State Minister for Gender, Labor and Social Development, Honorable P. Simtuzo, said this campaign is taking place amidst escalated cases of gender violence countrywide, which calls for concerted effort by all stakeholders to end violence against women and girls, involving raising awareness on gender-based violence, providing platform for dialogue, demonstrating solidarity of women and men on addressing issues of gender-based violence, and strengthening local networks for stakeholders to address gender-based violence. We'll kickstart a series of activities by state and non-state actors in different localities across the country. The Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development, on behalf of government, is coordinated efforts by all stakeholders around this campaign with the following objective. One, to raise awareness on gender-based violence as a human rights violation, public health rights, economic and social impediment, and the family, community, national, regional and international level. Two, provide a platform for dialogue and develop a strategy for sharing on good practices, for preventing and responding to gender-based violence. Three, demonstrate the solidarity of women and men to address issues of gender-based violence. Four, strengthen local initiatives and networks for stakeholders to address gender-based violence. Five, advocate for action by government, religious and cultural institutions, faith-based organizations, civil society organizations, the media and other actors. The minister further said it should be noted that prevalence of all forms of gender-based violence in the country remain unacceptably high, where 56% of able-married women and 44% of able-married men have experienced physical, sexual or emotional spousal of violence accompanied by increased child marriages at 34% female genital mutilation in northern Uganda, whereas according to the Uganda Police Crime Report 2020, over 14,000 cases of defilement were reported with 44% being boys and 59% girls aged between 13 and 17. Assess progress of actions being taken by all stakeholders to address gender-based violence. The status of gender-based violence in Uganda it should be noted that prevalence of all forms of gender-based violence in Uganda remain unacceptably high. Data from Uganda Demographic and Health Survey conducted in 2016 indicated that 56% of ever married and 44% of ever married men, so 56% of ever married women and 44% of ever married men have experienced spousal violence, either physical, sexual, or emotional. The national statistics show that over half of the women between 15 and 49 years have experienced violence, and more than one in every five young girls between the ages of 15 and 24 have experienced sexual violence in their lifetime. The national launch of the campaign will be held at Amaji Primary School, Kamdin Sub-County in Oyam District, under the COVID-19 special operating procedures, limiting the number of persons at the event. Let's go for a very quick short break. We will be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, you're still watching TV Africa News, the right to know. 
A former hotel driver went on trial in Paris on Monday, accused of complicity in Randa's 1994 genocide for transporting Hutu militia men who massacred hundreds of Tutsis. Investigators say Cloud Mohaimana also hid Tutsis at risk of death, helped some escape, fled after the genocide and gained a French nationality in 2010. Muhaimana was arrested in France in 2014 after an investigation by Paris prosecutors specializing in crimes against humanity. He spent a year in preventive detention before being released on probation when he resumed his work as a road repair agent in the northern French city of Rouen. He is accused of knowingly driving Hutu police and militiamen called the Interahamwe to carry out massacres in the western Chibuye region. Tens of thousands of Tusis were murdered as they sought shelter in schools, churches and hotels. Muhaimana, who was married to a Tusi woman at the time, has denied the charges, saying he was not in Chibuya when the massacres took place. Muhaimana, who will be the first ordinary citizen to face justice, having been considered respectable all around before the killings, said Alexandre Kiabisk, a lawyer for the collective of civil parties for Rwanda, CPCR, one of the plaintiffs. He faces a life sentence if convicted. France has generally refused requests to extradite suspects to Rwanda, prompting President Paul Kagame to accuse Paris of denying Rwanda jurisdiction. Moving on, Sudanese reinstated Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok said on Monday that he will have the authority to form an independent government. His comments took place one day after signing a deal with the military that almost one month earlier staged a coup and placed him under house arrest. Hamdok, who was re-elected as Prime Minister with the Sovereignty Council in Sudan, signed a political agreement on Sunday in order to end the management crisis that followed the military intervention on October 25th. As part of the deal, Bruhan rescinded his decision to dismiss Hamdok as Prime Minister. The Prime Minister's office also reported that Hamdok had officially taken up his duties. Abdallah Hamdok, Sudan's reinstated Prime Minister, admitted that he doesn't have any personal ambitions to remain a figurehead or to join a particular party or group or to gain higher popularity, but he is only driven by responsibility, placed on his shoulders and guided only by the ambitions and hopes of the Sudanese people. According to Sudanese medical sources, since the October coup, at least 41 people have lost their lives in protests. Omal Said, a Sudanese resident, said that the agreement is part of solving the problem because it needs a solution. The country's leading political opposition parties have said that they reject the deal with the generals. During the signing of the agreement with the military, Hamdok said that his main goal was to stop the ongoing bloodshed of the country's youth. Away from that, hundreds of protesters are rallied outside the White House in Washington, D.C. to voice their support for the Ethiopian government and denounce the U.S. government is foreign policy. They are seen as sympathetic to rebels fighting Addis Ababa. Hundreds of protesters held placards expressing support for Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and also slammed United States sanctions on the country and its neighbor Eritrea, which they said were meant to force Abiy to give in to his aggressors. Abel Gashe, a protester co-organizer and senior financial consultant from Northern Virginia, said that Ethiopians can govern their own affairs, adding that the United States should not interfere in its affairs. He said that they were there to say no more Afghanistan, no more Syria in Ethiopia, adding that Ethiopia can decide its own fate and the interference that they see from Western countries is totally uncalled for, not necessary and should stop. Rallies were also in London where demonstrators waved flags and let off smoke flares as they protested outside of the United States Embassy in London, calling for an end to what they say is American support for Tigray People's Liberation Front rebels. The United States has sanctioned Asmara for its role in the conflict in Ethiopia. Libya's interim Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Beiba on Sunday filed his candidacy to run for president in next month's elections despite being barred from elections under the current 
rules. Abdul Hamid Baba is made to, to lead the country until a winner is declared following presidential elections on December 24th. Libya's interim Prime Minister Abdul Hamid Deiba stated that he presented his candidacy papers to serve the people and not for anything else for the upcoming presidential elections and asked God to help them all for the good of the country and the good of the great nation and its great people. He is the latest high-profile candidate to emerge in the race. He submitted his application a day before the November 22nd deadline. The powerful businessman from the western city of Misrata is buried from running under Libya's current election laws. Hamid Deiba had promised he would not seek office in the vote as a condition to taking on his caretaker role earlier this year. In order to be eligible, he was supposed to have suspended himself from governmental duties at least three months before the polling date, which he failed to do. Deiba told the journalists he felt responsible for the continued reconstruction of the country, torn apart by years of civil war. It is not clear if the country's electoral commission will accept his candidacy. Earlier this month, several controversial candidates popped up including Saif al-Islam, the son and one-time heir apparent of Gaddafi. Military commander Khalifa Haftar, who besieged the capital of Tripoli for nearly a year in 2019, is also on the list. Deiba was appointed during the United Nations-led talks in April to lead the executive branch of interim government that also included a three-member presidential council chaired by Mohamed Yunis Memphi, a Libyan diplomat from the country's east. Before he took the position, he signed a pledge that he would not seek office in the next elections. Let's once again take a very quick short break. We will be right back. In our business news today, in the Makado Du 30, one of the largest markets in Rwanda, many vendors fear being contaminated by COVID-19 due to non-compliance in the use of masks and little social distancing. Those vaccinated have gone to the extent of seeking divine protection before undertaking their daily chores. Located in the Angolan municipality of Vienna, 30 kilometers from the capital Rwanda, Macedo Duthati is the largest open-air market supplying various products and also brings together thousands of people every day. The market's main source of income are women who fill most of this square for trading goods and services. Despite being aware of the dangers of COVID-19, most of these women go ahead with their duties with little attention to the precautions. Most don't wear face masks and no social distance is maintained. The almost non-existent physical distance is also a concern for the vendors who even though they have taken the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine say they are fearful but confident in God that he will protect them as they continue with their livelihoods. The short rains that hit Rwanda further complicated the movement of people inside the market due to the mud and puddles of water in the already narrow streets pushing vendors and buyers to be in contact. The Angolan health authorities have set up a vaccination post against COVID-19 in the market, which is being widely used by vendors, customers and residents in the surrounding area, as Lusa found out. Angola, just like the rest of the world, has been fighting the pandemic that has spread to all its 18 provinces. By 18th November, over 8 million doses of vaccine had been administered against the disease. In 
Ina Health, a new student in Nigeria, has launched a mass COVID-19 vaccination campaign in Abuja in an attempt to prevent a rise in cases of coronavirus. After several months since the introduction of the vaccines, some patrons say they are now convinced about the immunization. Let's take a look. This comes after repeated government assurances about the safety of the vaccines. One of the patrons, Philip Eninaya, said that she waited this long to take the vaccination because she wanted to be sure of which vaccine to take, adding that after her analysis and news and messages across the world, she decided to take the vaccine. Eninaya called upon all her family members and Nigerians to take the vaccines so that they can get immunity and go back to their normal lives again. Philip Eninaya added they are now convinced about the scientific process that brought the various vaccines and collaboration both locally and internationally and their National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control has also collaborated, meaning that it is safe. At Igo Square in the country's capital Abuja, dozens waited to receive the AstraZeneca and Moderna vaccines. Vaccination sites will also be set up at private health facilities, universities and shopping malls. Faizo Shuahib, Executive Director and Chief Executive of National Primary Health Care Development Agency, stated that they have been able to secure up to 100 million doses of vaccines and expect that with two doses, meaning that approximately about 50 million Nigerians will be vaccinated. He said that they are going to be targeting 112 million Nigerians, that's around 50% of the country's population. The West African nation has reported 2,973 deaths since the emergence of the pandemic is aiming to reach herd immunity against the virus. And in sports, Joshua Chiptege wins another shot at winning the prestigious World Authority of the Year. After voting, that included funds, which ended on November 6th. The Ugandan long-distance runner made it to the shortlist, as announced by the World Athletics on Monday. Chiptege, who has steadily turned into an athletic superstar, claimed gold and silver in the 5,000 meters and 10,000 meters at the Tokyo Olympics. He also ran a world-leading 8 hours, 9 minutes and 55 seconds over 2 miles at the Prefontaine Classic Meet in Oregon. The 25-year-old competes for the prestigious award with last year's winner in Swedish Paul Volta Mondo Diplantis, as well as Kenyan marathoner Iliud Chipchogi, who has won the accolade twice. Norwegian Hadler Kasten Warholm and American short putter Ryan Kruser are the other athletes who complete the short list. The winner will be announced at the World Athletics Award 2021, which will be held virtually on December 1st. That was the news. Thank you for always keeping it TV Africa. Please do stay tuned to more programming coming your way.